So today we are going to study about the morphological features of the acute rheumatic fever. Acute rheumatic fever. And the morphological feature is one of the most important characteristics in the pathognomic of the acute rheumatic fever is the scope bodies or scope nodules. So what are scope bodies or scope nodules? These are spherical or spiroidal or fusiform tiny structures about 1 to 2 mm in size and as I have already discussed they are the pathognomonic for rheumatic fever. They are one of the most characteristic feature of morphological feature of rheumatic fever. Scope bodies or scope nodules. So this is the picture of a scope body or a scope nodule. We will discuss the uh, components of the scope body is scope nodules in the coming slide. Now this scope body or scope nodules can exist in three forms. The early form, the intermediate form or the late form. So first of all studying about the early form and this is known as exudative or degenerative stage. This early stage or early form appears at about the fourth week of the illness and it, and it is characterized mainly by the pibrinite degeneration and this pibrinite degeneration is mainly due to the pigmentation of the collagen which is caused by the edema of the connective tissue and increased in the brown substance so for example these are the collagen filaments and increase in the blue i.e. edema or ground substance will put pressure on these collagens and eventually these collagens will break down resulting in degeneration of the collagens and when these degenerated collagen are stained by a specific stain they stain like a fibrin like a fibrin hence the name fibrinite i.e. fibrin like degeneration this is the picture which we can see fibrinite degeneration in the center now the second stage is, which is also known as intermediate state, proliferative stage or the granulomatous state. It is known as proliferative stage in a sense that in this stage the proliferation of the infiltrative cells occur and this will eventually result in the permission of <coughs> sorry, granulomatous like lesions. So hence also known as granulomatous stage. And it is this stage which is the pathognomic of the rheumatic conditions. Although the scope bodies can exist in three stages as I have already discussed, and, but this is it is this stage which is the pathognomic of the rheumatic fever. And it occurs in about 4 to 13 weeks of illness in contrast to the uh, early stage which appear within the fourth week of illness. And as I have already discussed, there is the proliferation and infiltration of the cells like the lymphocytes, mostly the T lymphocytes and plasma cells, a few neutrophils, and there is increased marked increase in the cardiac histocytes, which are also known as initial cells at the margin of the lesions. What are initial cells? We will discuss in the next slide. And all of these will result in the formation of granulomatous like lesions that I have already discussed. So what are anitro cells? They are also known as cardiac histocytes. So these are large mononuclear cells having a vesicular nuclei. Having a vesicular nucleoli containing prominent central chromatin mass which in longitudinal sections appear serrated or caterpillar like hence also known as caterpillar cells and when seen in the cross section it appears like in oval eye where large mononuclear cells having a vesicular nucleoli. This is not nucleoli, this is a nuclei. Having a vesicular nuclei containing prominent central chromatin, which when seen in longitudinal sections appear serrated or caterpillar like, and when seen in cross section, it appears like in Wells eye. Although these NHK cells are present in small numbers in normal herd and therefore they are not the characteristics of the rheumatic herd disease. So this is the picture of NHK cells. Here we can see the NHK cells. 
and this is the magnified picture of this error show cell here we can see the longitudinal section which we, in which we can see the nucleus and this is the caterpillar like central chromatin mass and this is the cross sections in which we can see the nuclear uh, central chromatin mass in the nucleus just looking lies in all eyes this is another picture of the inertro cell these are inertro cells now what are scope cells these are also characteristics of the scope nodules so these are body pipe cardiac histocytes or cardiac inertro cells when they become multinucleated when they combine and become multinucleated containing one to four nuclei and are called scope cells and they are the pathognomonic of rheumatic heart disease not the inertro cells or the cardiac histocytes but these scope cells when the cardiac histocytes combine to pipe multinucleated cells then they are the pathognomonic of rheumatic heart disease and are known as scope cells and these are the slides of the the scope cells here you can see the scope cells here also you can see a large scope cell containing many nuclei and here this is the inertro cells now talking about the late stage which is also known as healing stage or fibrosis by primer stage so it appears at about 12 to 16 weeks after the start of illness and in this the cardiac histocyte or inertro cells become spindle shaped and the nuclei stand solidly rather than the showing vesicular characteristics as we have seen in the intermediate stage they stand solidly also the nodule eventually become less cellular and the collagen tissue is increased Eventually, it, is, it will be replaced by a fibropolygenous scar and this will have very little cellularity and hence, it is, as, 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 we, as we have said in the name, it is also known as fibro stage or healing stage. It is because of this fibrocollagenous scar which will eventually form from this scope body or scope nodules. So, this was the, the, these were the three stages of the scopes uh, bodies or nodules now we will study the organ wise involvement of the, in of the body in the acute rheumatic fever what will be the changes in the organ which are mainly involved in the acute rheumatic fever so we have earlier discussed that the main organs which are involved in the acute rheumatic fever and the palm of heart bones uh, heart giants brain in, in, in the sudden hemoria and other organ like the skin or subcutaneous nodules. So these are some organs which are involved in the acute rheumatic fever or uh, rheumatic heart disease. So we will study the changes in these organs, the microscopic and gross changes in the, these organs. So first talking about the migratory polyarthritis. Migratory polyarthritis, these are the morphological changes in the joints. So migratory polyarthritis, these the changes, the microscopic changes are mainly transitory, i.e. they are transit as, have, as have, I, I have earlier discussed. And on microscopy, we can see the cyanobial membrane and the periarticular connective tissue. There is hyperemia, edema, fibrinite change, and neutrophil infiltrations. And sometimes there are also focal lesions resembling scope bodies and in this scope bodies can be in any stage the late stage the intermediate or the early stage and and when they present in any stage there will be the characteristics of this stage as we've already discussed like the pubertite degeneration and at short cells or the fibrovascular scars there are also serious effusions into a giant cavity now the most common organ which is involved in the acute rheumatic fever is the heart and when this is involved it is known as rheumatic heart disease so rheumatic pancarditis this is not pericarditis this is pancarditis 
rheumatic pain carditis as we've already discussed it all the three layers are involved so the first one is the rheumatic endocarditis this endocarditis may be due to the involvement of the valve is the valve also the is the endopodium also cover the valve so it will it will be known as rheumatic valvulitis or it will involve the normal endopodium uh, covering the chambers of the heart so it is known as neural endocarditis the second one, second one will be in the form of rheumatic myocarditis when it involves the myocardium and it will be rheumatic pericarditis when it involves the pericardium. So first talking about the rheumatic polyvulitis, so grossly we can see that the mitral valve is the most commonly valve involved as we've already discussed. It is characterized by the thickening of the valve leaflets or cusps. There will be small but multiple small multiple vegetations or which is also known as vericue which will be gray brown in color translucent and are pebbly attached along the lines of closure that will lead to the regurgitation they are pebbly attached they are small they are multiple gray brown translucent and the most important pebbly attached i.e. there are no chances of there are no chances of embolization along the lines of closure it will lead to the regurgitation so these are some gross features which occur in the rheumatic pulmonitis as you can see in this picture and the histological features there will be inflammatory changes the scope bodies will be present and this scope bodies will be in any stage in the early stage characterized by brunette degeneration in the inter intermediate stage or in the late stage this can be seen in any stage and there will be isonopilic vegetations tiny structures mainly consisting of fibrin with superimposed platelet and thrombi and they do not contain bacteria as you already discussed vegetation and this vegetation will be seen as synopelic and microscopy and this vegetation of tiny structures consisting mainly of fibrin, platelets and thrombi. This is the histological feature. Here this is the normal endocardium and here we can see the thrombus consisting of fibrin, platelets and thrombi. And this is the gross picture of the vegetation here we can see these are all vegetations along the line of closures of the mitral wall now the mural endocarditis grossly the lesion can be seen as mechelum page which are made like area of the thickened roughened and wrinkled part of the endocardium in the posterior wall of the left atrium just above the posterior leaflets of the mitral wall. In neural endocarditis, the lesion can be seen as mechelum page, which are map like first one, thickened, second one, roughened, third one, wrinkled, fourth one. And where is they are present? They are present in the posterior wall of the left atrium just above the posterior leaflets of the mitral valve which we will see in the next slide in the next picture and microscopically we can see the appearance of mechelum which is similar to that seen in rheumatic valvulitis i.e. there will be inflammatory uh, infiltrates there will be scope bodies in any stage and there will be also we can see vegetations so here we can see the atrium the lip atrium and here we can see this is the mechelum's page around the posterior endocardium and this is the rear picture of the mechelum's page here we can see the mechelum's page in the lip atrium Now, when it involves the myocardium, this is known as rheumatic myocarditis, and grossly we can see the myocardium, and it involves mainly the left ventricle, and the myocardium is sloped and flabby, and there are small foci of necrosis. Small foci of necrosis. Microscopically, there will be presence of distinguished scope bodies in 
any stage as you already discussed in the early layer on intermediaries and they are mainly present throughout the interstitial tissue of the myocardium and most frequent in the interventricular septum left ventricle and the left atrial so the most distinguished and characteristic feature is the scope bodies in the interstitial tissues of the myocardium and when it involves the pericardium it is known as rheumatic pericarditis grossly we can see the loss of the normal shiny pericardial surface due to the deposition of fibrin on its surface grossly and this is known as fibrinous pericarditis loss of the normal shiny pericardial surface there are also we can see the bread and butter appearance and this is the shaggy parietal and visceral surfaces in the bread and butter appearance there will be shaggy parietal and visceral surfaces and we can also see in the later, later stages is a fibrous adhesion of the two layers resulting in the chronic adhesive pericarditis so the important features are loss of the normal shiny pericardial surfaces there will be bread and butter appearance in which we can see the shaggy parietal and visceral surfaces they are known as the bread and butter appearance because for example if this is the visceral layer and this is the parietal layer so the position of fibrin between this layer will give a characteristics bread and butter appearance the visceral and parietal layers becoming the bread and the butter formed by the fibrin ha viral the third one is in the palm of fibrous adhesions now microscopically we can see that fibrin is present on the surfaces and we can also see the scope bodies in any of the stages now the subcutaneous nodules what are subcutaneous nodules they are small painless swellings usually on the bony prominences and microscopically they consist of three distant zones a central area the fibrinoid changes surrounded by a zone of histocytes and fibroblast and the outermost zones consisting of connective tissue which is infiltrated mainly by non specific chronic inflammatory cells in the proliferating blood vessels fibrinoid degeneration surrounded by a zone of histocytes and fibroblast and is surrounded by a zone of chronic inflammatory cells in proliferating blood vessels now when the brain is involved it appears in the form of sudden hemorrhage which is rapid involuntary movement of the limbs so the lesions are mostly located in the cerebral hemispheres brain stems and the basal ganglia as these are the main uh, part of the brain which control the movement and they mainly consist of small hemorrhages edema perivascular infiltration of the lymphocytes and there may be an arteritis obliterans and thrombosis of the cortical and meningeal vessels so these are the some changes which occur in the brain in the sudden hemorrhage